Welcome to your hope-filled perspective, where it's our goal to restore hope, renew minds, and empower listeners to live in their God-given identity. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Bankson, and I'm thrilled that you've decided to spend a few minutes of your week with us. I want to share a couple of scriptures with you that I think will be appropriate to this week's episode. The first is Psalm 4610. Be still or cease striving and know I am God. And the second is from Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Today, we're going to be talking about overcoming overwhelm. On today's show, we're going to be talking with my friend Patty Scott, author of Slow Down Mama, Intentional Living in a Hurried World. Patty writes, speaks, and coaches to encourage your heart to share effective and transparent parenting tips, and to walk alongside you as you grow as a woman and a mom. Her writing is conversational and approachable. She shares from the heart to the heart. Patty and her husband have two boys aged 11 and 18 and a foster daughter who is now 21. Patty loves coffee dates with friends, ministry to women, escaping into a good book, kayaking on the ocean, and taking spontaneous road trips. Her home and table are an intentional place of welcome. I want to welcome you to the show, Patty. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So, Patty, so often our ministries are born out of our own life experiences. You mentioned to me prior to this recording that your life mission is summed up in Isaiah 61 to bind up the brokenhearted, help set the captives free, and proclaim the good news. Where did your passion come from? Isaiah 61 has long been your passion to bind up the brokenhearted, help set the captives free, and proclaim the good news. Where did your passion come from, Patty? Well, like you say, when it comes from your life experience, I um, had lived a very striving life. As you mentioned, Psalm 46, that's a dear verse to me because um, when, when I got down to the fact that that not just be still, but cease striving and the way that we lean on ourselves instead of leaning on God. And even as a Christian, I had done a lot of works righteousness living, not even realizing that's what I was doing, trying to build up my spiritual resume to impress God with how good I could be and how much um, how much worth I had for him to want me. And I think that just came out of a childhood of um, a lot of expectations put on me and misguided. Um, you know, my parents just didn't know, uh, how, my parents didn't know Jesus. So they didn't have a way of conveying to me grace and um, the fact that it's not up to me. So I grew up kind of feeling like it was all up to me. And so I entered Christianity uh, still feeling that it was all up to me and not realizing that it's really all up to Jesus. I cooperate with him, but he's the one at work to will and do his good pleasure. So it is, has been a journey of release, a journey of learning that my, um, my job is not to earn anything, that my effort is good, but my effort is not for earning. It's a gratitude. It's a response to his goodness. And effort is good, but effort based on earning is a heavy yoke that we can't bear. So through that, I um, was talking to a friend after I'd written a book on uh, parenting teenagers. And she said, oh, I need that book. Make it into an audio book. I'm too busy to read books. And I know a lot of moms are. And I got out my car. We were at a heart um, foundation event, actually. And I got out my car and I thought, man, so many moms are so busy. And I know what it's like because I've been there. And so I went from that and just grabbed my notebook out of my glove box and jotted down all these notes. It was like the Lord just downloaded this book to me in that moment that moms need this message of slowing down the message that I had learned and not so much that our lives look like a snail, you know, going across the road. We're all busy full, but I looked at the difference between being properly busy and being, um, being just overwhelmed busy and there is a proper busyness when we choose the events that we're going to be doing we know they're filtered through our purpose 
and when we just are running crazy because we're trying from the wrong um, part of our heart. So that's been my background and how I ended up coming with this message being such a big part of what I am sharing with women these days. And it seems to be one that really resonates in this culture. We're all very busy and, and a lot of times overwhelmed with that. So yeah. It resonates with my heart too, because for a good 40 years, I lived in that same striving mentality to the point that I thought if I did more, maybe God would love me more. Right. And I think that's an easy trap for us to fall into because that's what our culture says. You know, mm -hmm. our culture says, if it's going to be, it's up to me, which is not biblical. But I had fallen into that trap thinking, well, if I just do more, then God will love me more. And in actuality, right. the lesson I learned, I think is probably similar to yours. And that is, if I never do another thing, God's not going to love me less. And if I keep striving, yeah. he's not going to love me more. The goal is to be right. busy doing what he asks us to do instead of striving for our worth or for his approval or love. Yes. And when I had, um, after about four years after my first son was born, I had a period where my brain was very foggy and I could not focus and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me for a good year. I was really struggling and I'm a doer, 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 get her done, you know, can do 10 things at once, high energy kind of person. So this thing where I couldn't even get the energy to like carry a beach chair to that beach, you know, when we would get there and my husband's like, you're doing too much if you're this worn out, you know? And what happened was at the end of that, um, we realized that, um, I had a thyroid issue that we hadn't known about and they had died. They had tried to find out about that, but it turned out I didn't, they couldn't figure out, um, that it was actually, um, thyroid, even though they tested, it didn't show up at first. So, um, Anyway, through that time with much less focus, with much less focus on my, um, on my own, um, I'm sorry, I got distracted <laughs> with, um, through that time, I could not do what I was used to doing. And as a result of that, I realized that I, my value, God gave me this message. Your value is not in what you do. You're incapacitated right now. You can't do what you used to do. And yet my love is still as strong. I'm still as present in your life. And it was a very disarming experience for me because I was used to doing so much. And it was, the, it was one of the pieces. It wasn't like a complete turning point, but it was one of the pieces that he put in place to show me that this isn't about what you do for me. I don't need you. I made the earth and everything in it in six days without your help, you know, and I'll sustain it without your help. You're not a hinge pin, you know, and that is such a relief because while we contribute to God, he doesn't need us to do anything, you know, and we're, it's an invitation to participate with him, but there's not the pressure or the burden of that. So, anyway. So you wrote a book entitled Slow Down Mama, okay. Intentional Living in a Hurried World. And your book starts with this line. I wore busyness like a badge of honor. Tell me what drove you to be so busy and how it felt like a badge of honor to you. Right. And as you said, Michelle, this was something that was so wound up in my worth. I felt like my own personal worth was, um, measured by how busy I was. So I would look at people who were not as busy and think maybe they should be busier. You know, when people would say, you're so busy, instead of it being a wake up call to me, I took it as something like, yeah, I'm so busy. Why aren't you, you know? And, and my husband is very relaxed, chill person. He gets things done, but he also knows how to rest. And he's been very helpful to me in my healing journey to learn how to sit still and how to take time out. But when he would say things like, why don't you sit down? You know, you're always moving around the house doing something. I would think, why don't you stand up? You know, and so it really was this thing where there was pride wound up in um, this thought of being a busy person was part of my value, part of my worth. And it's what made me a good person. And people who weren't living in that same way, I felt that they maybe weren't as good as I was. And so um, that's almost embarrassing to admit, but it's really where our hearts are. Sometimes we don't see our own hearts a lot of times unless we examine them. And my heart was in a prideful place. And that was partly based on fear. Like you said, that God wouldn't value me without all my contributions. Mm -hmm. If I had nothing left to give, what was left of me except for my doing. And so I didn't know how to value my being. And, and that's been a transition to learn to value my being over my doing. I went through a similar situation years ago where 
I would be at the office 20 hours a day. You know, I'd be there from three o'clock in the morning until midnight. And I remember similar to what you were saying, friends would say, you are always working. You're always so busy. And I thought, well, that's what we're supposed to do, right? I mean, and like you, I would think, why aren't you busier? <laughs> and my husband and I have the same mm -hmm. dynamic as you and your husband. My husband knows how to relax. He knows how to like say I'm done for the day. And I would still have 27 more things that I'd want to get done. And I would get aggravated. Like, why aren't you doing more? And he'd be like, why aren't you relaxing? <laughs> so, and mine really came because I thought my worth was wrapped up in how much I did. It was a big wake up call for me to realize God never called me to be that busy. Right. And I remember um, Dallas Willard was a person who influenced me greatly. And he would tell us things like Jesus took time off. Jesus was never in a hurry. And that was such a blessing to me to hear, you know, hear those words and to think about how Jesus walked this earth, the most important person who ever lived. Yes, he was God, but he was also human. In his humanity, he taught us so much. And he never rushed. He took time off. He spent whole days aside people would be saying, go do this. Why aren't you doing this part? This is so important. And he valued taking that time off, setting time aside for just with his friends, time aside alone with God. And if he did that, certainly I'm not more important than he is. And I need to do the same thing. So yeah. I think about that too, because he only had three years for his yeah. entire ministry, yet he was willing to take time off. He was willing to take time to rest. He was willing to take time to spend with his father. What a perfect example for us. Yes. What did you discover was at the root of your busyness? Yeah. And in the book, I do go into this and um, I discovered a lot of things at the root of my busyness. Um, some of it was perfectionism, um, trying to strive to be something if, which is a lot of times comes from fear because we don't want to be rejected. So we try to be perfect in order to cover up our vulnerabilities. And the irony of that is that truly human beings and even God in us, we, we unite in our vulnerability. We unite in places of vulnerability. So that's where we draw near to one another, but trying to cover all those up and be perfect, that takes a lot of effort and it keeps you very busy. Other things were fear of missing out. I had a fear that something was going to go on and I wasn't going to be present for it. And again, that has to do with value, right? Because if we don't know our value, then we want everybody to include us because what if they forget us what if we don't show up and then we're forgotten and we're set to the side so we can't have that happening you know and and the superwoman syndrome was in the middle of it um there were just so many different things and i go into each of those in the book because i have in the book i want women to look at um what might be at the root because i think when we get to the roots like i'm a gardener so i think when i have a tree a fruit tree and there's yellowing on the leaves or there's a black spot on the leaves. You always want to go down under and find out what is going on at the root of that tree. Because if you just spray the leaves, maybe that problem will go away, but it's going to come back or, and then tenfold really. And so you want to get at the nutrient level or the, the what's going on in the soil and the water and what's going on with those roots. And that's what um, God wants for us. He, he always talks about our heart. And so what's at the root of our busyness? And then when we find that out, we can go there with God and he can treat those roots and help us to overcome the things that were driving us. And then we're no longer driven in that way. I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. Friends, we're going to take a real quick one minute commercial break, but stick with us to hear Patty share more about what she learned about overcoming overwhelm. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your Hope Filled Perspective. Patty, I'm curious, how have you learned to make room for what matters most? How do you balance that striving for that busyness and actually coming to the recognition of here's what's really important? Right. And so I have adopted a practice, which has been one of the keys for me. Um, and, and it involves prayer. It involves setting time aside to seek my purpose. And so what I do is I do a 90 day planning every, um, so for 12 weeks, I'm going to kind of live out the plan. And then the 13th week, I still am living life. I'm still cooking dinner and vacuuming my house and doing whatever needs to be. But during that 13th week, I'm really focusing on 
looking ahead for the next coming three months and seeing what it is that God wants me to do. So during that time, I'll set aside a lot more time for prayer, focus, seeking God and orienting myself towards what's going to be happening during those months. So from like, you know, it, and I kind of do them seasonally, but they're a little wonky. They're not exactly like January to March because really January is more part of winter than it is part of spring. So I do kind of like a winter, spring, summer, fall orientation. And during those times, I'm able to look at um, what is it you're calling me to God? So if, for example, I'm writing a book, that's a primary focus for those 90 days. I'm not looking at marketing. I'm not looking at um, maybe, you know, other areas of where I put a lot of effort. I may keep some of those things sustained, but my main focus is that book. So then emails that come in that aren't related to that, I table or toss. Um, I just filter through that purpose, that, that immediate purpose. I also look at my motherhood that way. So I'll look at what are the areas that my sons need to grow in over these next three months, what are some character issues that we've seen coming up? What are some things I want to build in? What are the goals that they're aiming towards? So then I can focus of a three month span. You can really hone in on things that have been coming up mm -hmm. and really get into those. I can look at my own spiritual life. God, where are you calling me right now? And he really surprised me one time when I sat with him and that's when he gave me that Isaiah 61 verse or set of verses I knew, I heard this word from him and he kept saying, you know, um, set the captives free, bind up the brokenhearted. And I thought, where did Jesus say that? So I scanned, I didn't use my concordance. I read the gospels looking for him to say that and looking and I was writing down in the meantime, what were all Jesus's purposes? What did he come here to do? What did he say he came here to do? Mm -hmm. And I kept not finding this word and I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to use the concordance <laughs> about three gospels in. I'm like, I'm not finding this. I've got to find it. And I go back and find it in Isaiah 61. And I was like, this is it. This is, and God resonated it in my heart and then how he echoes himself over the coming week there were several other places where that verse came up and so I just knew God you are really telling me this is my life purpose this is my overarching that this is God's purpose but he's invited me into it with him and so he wants to use my life to preach the good news to set captives free and to bind up the brokenhearted and so that's given me a global purpose and then I've got segmented to be able to look at something short, Jesus knew that he told us to do 24 hours. Look at the day at hand. It's got enough trouble of its own. Don't look ahead. You're too big. It's too big for you. You're only small. You can handle this much. It's the same thing with the 90 days. If I can look ahead 90 days, I can weed out so many things. So that has really been one of the keys, to, uh, practical keys as to how I live this out. Mm, I love that. When we look for the next five years, it can be overwhelming. But if we're willing yeah. to focus on smaller chunks and be open to the Lord's leading, he's never going to lead us into overwhelm. So I, I like that perspective. And I like how you've made it seasonal as opposed to just starting with January, because I'm thinking December, December is a hard month to sit down and try to focus on the upcoming months. Right. So I love that. But you know, as I'm sitting here thinking, I think one of the consequences, but also one of the contributors to overwhelm is procrastination. What have you learned about procrastination and yes. how have you released the habit of putting things off until the last minute? I have actually studied, you probably have too, I've studied the way the brain is rewarded by procrastination and I've studied what goes on during procrastination because I like to study the brain as you do too, so yeah. we have that in common. But the brain um, actually gets a reward during procrastination and um, what happens when we procrastinate, we're afraid we're not going to get the good stuff. We're afraid that we're if we get busy doing the hard thing, whatever it is we're, we're avoiding, that we're going to miss out on this thing that we want. So instead we put the, it's like eating dessert before dinner. You know, our kids want that. They come, mom, can I have a cookie? No, we're going to eat dinner, you know, but here we are inside of our own heads kind of asking ourselves for a cookie before dinner. And so we, but what happens is we're as adults able to get the cookie before dinner. And so we go do that. And then the brain gets that little ping like, oh, yes, you just got something good. And it kind of reinforces this procrastination habit. But what happens is things pile up on us and then we end up so overwhelmed and we have this albatross, this fear sitting on, oh, what if I don't get to that? And it nags at us and we go to bed worried that we didn't finish something. So it's an intentional practice to do the hard thing. It's an intentional practice to go ahead and get that thing done. And that gives us a reward. When we finish something that we were putting off and we level out that to-do list or shorten it, 
because sometimes there's a healthy form of procrastination mm -hmm. where we say, you know what, that doesn't actually have to be done today. So then I consciously choose to put it off instead of like doing this little game, procrastination game. If I choose to put something off, I'm now empowered that, you know what, that was a choice. I don't have to do that this week. And I've lightened my load. And God wants me to have a lighter load. He doesn't want me living in slavery, which procrastination is bondage. Yeah. And so it's been a freeing thing to take responsibility for what needs to be done. Do it first. Give myself rewards after the thing is done and move through obligations that way and also choose well and I have a little acronym. I say I ate that and all the words I use in it are eight. So it's like I I um, evaluate and then I delegate or collaborate and then I healthy procrastinate. So I go through this process and I talk about that in the book too, but I go through a process when I brain dump first, everything that's overwhelming me. And then I sort through it to make myself know what actually needs to be done and what doesn't. And that really does help me um, to keep away from procrastination. And you are so right. It is such a trap. And it's one of those things that if we can overcome, teach ourselves, we have to teach ourselves like we teach our children. If it's a habit we have, we can undo it, but we have to consciously engage in stopping it. I think that's so important too, because we can be a slave then to procrastination. Mm -hmm. And it exactly. is rewarding, but not in a healthy way. No. So I love that approach. Tell us a little bit about what is your perspective on the Sabbath? and how we underestimate its necessity and its usefulness, usefulness in our lives. Because I'm going to be honest, during those years when I was so driven and was striving so much, I remember thinking, I don't have time to take a Sabbath. Exactly. Instead of recognizing that God didn't give us the Sabbath as a punishment, he gave it to us as a gift. Mm -hmm. So what, did, what have you learned about the Sabbath? Yes. And you were learning to overcome overwhelm. And you know, the, one of the most beautiful things about the Sabbath is Jesus himself says he'll be our Sabbath rest. He is our rest. He is the resting place. And so I have learned to incorporate rest in so many different ways. It almost became a passion for me once I started figuring out how important it was because I find the more I rest, the more I accomplish, honestly. And it's one of those paradoxes that we think we don't have the time for rest, but when we're not rested, we, we lose our perspective. We lose our sense of, of um, balance and the ability to respond well because we need a buffer, a margin in our life to be able to, to evaluate things and, and to reason through things rather than just being reactive. But when we're on the go all the time, we're so burdened, we just react. And a lot of times that comes out in our motherhood, which is what I'm writing. I'm writing a book now called um, Simmer Down Mama instead of Slow Down Mama. And it's overcome, it's moving from anger to gentleness in your motherhood. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on, and that is a lot of times what contributes to that explosive interactions with our children. We're on the go, we're running, 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 we're so busy. And we don't have a spare minute to pause and come from a place of peace and quiet within our hearts. We come from that hurried rush place and we lash out at our children and we have regret and guilt, remorse and all of that. Boy, so, isn't that the truth. <laughs> so let's, so I'm, I'm working on helping moms come out of that as well, because that's another area that God has moved me through and wants me to share. But I think as we learn the gift of rest, and I love what Tim Keller says about this, he says, we learn to work from a place of rest. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a place of rest to work from that place of rest. Mm -hmm. And then when we cultivate that, I think of it, and I really, there's been times when I've sat quietly with the Lord on a personal retreat and he and I've kind of cultivated this vision or whatever in my heart of this wide open field. And it's a really beautiful place. And it's like, every time I go away with him, I gain more acres. I get more acres on my property. So that place is just expanding out where I share that with him. That's our property together. And, and we're buying up more all the time. And so the more time I spend with him in the mornings or in the evenings or throughout my day, or as I go away intentionally to be alone with him, those times buy me more acres and I have more space on that land. And then I'm able to move around more freely and I come out into the world from that place instead of from this hurried, harried place, you know, living in a cramped little condo with people all around me, no time and no space. I have all the space in the world. 
and it gives me a much more measured and peaceful place to live from. So even as a mom of young kids, because a lot of the women I minister to, they've got Legos everywhere. They've got dishes piled in the sink. They've got kids yanking on them. They've got to nurse one child because the other one to take a bath. It's busy. I mean, it's innately busy, mm -hmm. but we don't have to be coming from a frenetic place. We don't have to be frenzied in the way that we go about our motherhood. We can cultivate calm in our hearts. It's intentional. We have to take the time and make it happen, but we can go about even that season of life, even the season of life when your teenagers are out all night and you're wondering what's going on with them and you're scared and nervous and you can't sleep well because you're anxious over the choices they're making. That's a whole other level of motherhood that drains us, but we can come about that from a place of rest and it really is a gift from God. So that's how I look at Sabbath. I do take intentional times through the week, through the day, through the months, through the year, measured out. And, and those all are a blessing. They're a gift that we need to receive from him. So let's talk very practically for a minute to the listener who is thinking, I've got the dirty dishes in the sink and there's a load of laundry in the wash and another load in the dryer and I don't have sheets on the bed and I've got to pick up Susie from preschool. How can we help her to recognize moments where she can practice rest despite the busyness because I'm sure that's what a lot of my listeners are thinking right now is well that's all well and good for her I can't take a day a week a month right to engage in the Sabbath so how can they start small right. within the busyness of today right I think there are two parts to that Whenever we approach something with an I can't, it expresses our desperation for it. We're desperate. We feel like somebody else is getting something we're not. But I want to say this verse over all of us. God has given me everything I need for life and godliness. He has provided it. And if he calls me to something, he's not playing a game. He's not being mean to me. He's not asking me, go get rest. And oh, she can't have it. He's not doing that. So if he's asking me to rest, he's providing the rest. Mm -hmm. And the biggest way I can find that in my own life is to ask him, Lord, how does this work for me? I can't go in. I mean, I can get to know a woman and give her some suggestions, but I can't go into somebody's home, carte blanche, not having been there and say, this is what you need to do. That woman and God can work this out. And first thing of all is we need to seek God in his kingdom and he will show us the ways that rest can work in. But a small ways, small ways. Your kids nap most days, take nap time, not to fritter, not to rob yourself of something, but to give yourself something. What is the most nourishing, restful thing you can do during nap time? And do that. Not get to the next load of this and the next whatever. You can do that while your kids are awake. Do something you can't do while your kids are awake while they're sleeping to give yourself some nourishment. Maybe if you're married and you have a spouse coming home in the evening, get take turns, give some time. And if he's willing, I know not every husband is that way. So if your husband, husband isn't willing, maybe a neighbor friend and you can swap some time, get very creative about how to carve out these times and guard them with your life. That's all I can say. Some seasons are just harder to snatch this up and know that you're not going to be in this season forever. So one of the things I really um, harp on with myself and other moms is that we need to savor the goodness of the seasons we're in. And sometimes that's restful. Just being with God, I'm making a bed. Can I make it in a frenzied way with my heart all stirred up? Or can I calm down while I'm making this bed? And just be with Jesus and talk to him, turn on worship music and turn my, my eyes and heart towards him while I'm doing what I have to do in that day. There's a different attitude of the heart that's restful there. So sometimes it's just the way, you know, C.S. Lewis says this, it's not the load you carry, but how you carry it that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. And so how do I carry the loads that I have? I can carry them restfully or I can carry them like I'm a crazy person yes. and I've done both. <laughs> so, I, I have too. <laughs> and I will tell you that, you know, when I'm going about my day, if I will have praise and worship music going in the background, that settles my heart. So I'm breathing deeper and I'm communing with the Lord while I'm going about the tasks that have to get done. Yes. I can pray while I wash the dishes and I can hum along with the praise and worship music while I strip the beds. It makes a difference. I think where our focus is mm -hmm. and we're, we're so focused on the tasks that have to get done. We cannot be focused on God. And he's the one who says, look, my yoke is easy we make our yoke hard. Mm -hmm. 
But when, yeah. when we're spending time with him, he will make it easy. He will. Friends, There's we're going to take a real quick one minute commercial break, but stick with us because we're going to come back and ask Patty to share her hope filled perspective. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope filled perspective, where today we've been talking about how to overcome overwhelm. Such an important topic. Patty, I'm wondering if a listener is struggling with feeling like their life is overwhelming. What hope-filled perspective would you want to offer them? I would say um, you don't have to stay here. God isn't going to leave you stuck. We all, and we will, and I say overwhelm is like dust because if you ever dust your home and it looks perfect and everything's dusted off and then two days later you look around and you need to dust again or your garage, you know, we clean it out and then somehow two months later, there's all this stuff in the garage again. You've so, been eavesdropping, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of those things that it's not a one and done. And I think a lot of times we think with these habits of our heart and habits of life that we're going to get them done and then we don't have to worry about overwhelm anymore. But there are constant opportunities and demands that come towards us. And so it's more of a cultivating of a skill and continually checking in with ourselves. So if I'm, I get back into overwhelm, it just, it will happen, you know, just like there's going to be dust on my shelves. But what do I do? How do I face that once I realize, wait, I'm overwhelmed. I need skills to get myself back out of that. The word no is a huge skill. I love the book by Lisa Turkers called The Best Yes. It's one of my favorite books on this subject. And in it, she talks about all the different ways we can say no, all the different ways we say yes when we really ought to be saying no. And, and it's so helpful because I need to choose. Once again, I might say, oh, you know what? I've said too many yeses. Are there some I can responsibly back out of? Are there some things I can do? halfway and let the people know, share the burden or do whatever. How can I evaluate this so I can back out and back down and get my life back down to size? When I talk to groups of moms, I have a lot of times bring those little plastic grocery bags, the ones that we buy at Trader Joe's or wherever. And um, I will bring all these objects and I put, you know, our kids need basketball lessons and they need dance lessons and they need music lessons. And we start to pile and I've got to do my hair and I'm supposed to work out. And I start putting all these objects in and the bag just mounts up. And then I have a Bible there's just not a lot of time left for the Lord. And mm -hmm. then I have a little negligee and maybe my husband and I might get a little time together at some point. You know, there's just not time for the things that we really are going to savor the most and that are going to feed our souls. So how do we take our bag and realize what size it is? Then what if we have health concerns? Our bags get so small. What if one of our children has extra needs? Our bags shrink. We can't fit everything back in. So when our bag shrinks, we have to choose well, what's going in that bag in this season? And in, in early motherhood and different stages of motherhood, it's just naturally a small bag season. And so we have to choose well what fits. So choose well and know you don't have to stay there. I think those are my two words of encouragement. I love that. Choose well and know what fits. The other thing that I would offer is to really put your blinders on. And by that, I mean, don't compare your life and what God has called you to do in this season with what everybody around you is doing. Because for me, I have found that comparison is one of the driving factors that will make me continue to add and add and add and add when I don't have the time or the energy or maybe even ultimately the desire. But I look at what other people are doing and think I need to be doing that too. Mm -hmm. We only need to be doing what God has asked us to do. So there's a beautiful me, verse. A oh, there's a beautiful verse for that, Michelle. Um, in and I forget where it is. I should know it. It's in the Psalms, but it says, "He has drawn my lines in pleasant places. Surely my inheritance is rich." Mm -hmm. When I stay in the lines that God has drawn for me, they're pleasant places. It doesn't mean everything that happens in there is, ple is pleasant. You and I have both been in recent seasons that have been very unpleasant experiences, but the the lines are pleasant. He gives us the lines to show us, this is where I want you, my daughter. Stay here. Don't go outside. And Eve's sin was to step outside the lines. God drew a line and she said, and Satan said, is that really the line that God wants you to stay in? Is there really goodness inside of here or is it on the other side? And we're always tempted with Eve's, Eve's temptation to step over our lines and go to somewhere that he hasn't called us to be. If we know our lines and we stay there, that's where the blessings are. That's where the pleasantness is. So I totally agree with you 100%. That is a good word and a good way to end this episode. Patty, I'm wondering if you would be willing to pray for our listeners 
who've been listening in today and they're feeling overwhelmed. As one who has been there, would you be willing to pray for them and close us out? Absolutely. Father God, we love you. You are a provider. You are the lifter of our heads and you have an easy yoke for us. Lord, thank you that you bear that burden and train us into how to walk beside you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I pray for each woman that's listening to this, this podcast that they would cast their cares on you because you care for them, that you would show them where their lines are and that you delight in them, that you dance over them, that you sing over them with rejoicing, Lord, that you call them your own. Help them to find their worth in the love that you have for them as is and give them the satisfaction of living within what you've set up for them at this time. Father, help them to choose well, help them to walk well, help them to savor the life that you've given them and help them to say no where their no is and yes where their yes is according to your will and your word. And we pray these things in your sweet and precious name. Amen. Oh, Patty, thank you so very much. Thank you for helping us to get a better sense of how to overcome overwhelm. Friends, I'm going to be putting Patty's, a link to Patty's book in our show notes. I hope that you'll consider picking it up. Until next time, this has been your hope-filled perspective. May you make it a hope-filled week.